Hi, and welcome back for another Tech Tuesday. Today, we're talking about battery relocations. Often it's convenient to move the car's battery from the engine bay into the trunk or boot in order to make room for engine mods or help with weight distribution. But please don't use convenience as the wiring method when you're doing it. The car battery's job appears pretty simple. It supplies 12 or 16 volts to the car's electrical system in order for the starter motor to function, which gets the engine running, which turns the alternator, which charges the battery. If the alternator doesn't charge the battery, the battery goes flat. If the battery goes flat, you can't start the engine to get the alternator spinning to charge the battery, and you're stuck in a loop of the car not running. Then it's time to jump start it. So the battery supplies power to the car's electrical system, but it also filters the electrical system. The charge coming from the alternator is often noisy and struggles to supply huge instantaneous current. So if we think of the battery kind of like an electrical surge tank, we're, we're on the right track. Uh, this means that our wiring needs to be right and we need to make sure all electrical devices in the car have good access to the battery's power and the alternator has a good connection to the battery in order to keep it charged. First things first, the right battery needs to be selected. It'd be your best bet to check with your local racetrack or governing body at this point. They may have specific rules on battery mounting positions, battery types and battery enclosures. If you're mounting the battery inside the passenger compartment, it should be a fully sealed dry cell style battery, regardless of the regulations. If it's been mounted outside of the passenger compartment, it should still be a dry cell style battery. Normal lead acid style batteries can certainly be used, but they require an externally vented battery enclosure and have a chance of leaking nasty hydrogen gas and sulfuric acid if it all goes pear shaped. So best to use the right battery for the job. Next, choosing the right sized battery. In my opinion, bigger is better. If you have the space and can afford to carry a few extra kilos, then go for it. There's no downside. Now, when mounting a fully sealed dry cell battery, remember that man will need to hold up if the car's ever in an accident. The last thing you want is the battery to come loose and go flying through the passenger's compartment. There's plenty of really nice billet mount kits available. Get one when you get the battery and make sure to secure it into a solid part of the car as low as possible. Once you have the battery mounted, it needs to be wired in. This is where most of the problems happen. So keep it simple and do it right. You don't need to add 50 ground straps, just a simple copper thick gauge, something like zero ground cable that goes from the negative side of the battery to the block and from the same position on the block to the strut tower. Take a look at your daily driver. I suspect it'll be done in exactly this way. The problems start to arise when you ground the chassis in the boot and then assume the rest of the car has good grounding. Not the case. We use copper wires for a reason. It conducts electricity well. The 0.8 mil sheet steel in the floor pan of your boot with a tech screw holding down the ground cable just won't cut it. It might work for a little while, but sooner or later, it'll cause you trouble. Yes, yes, I know, some factory cars have trunk mounted batteries and they work fine. But take a look at how the wiring's done. Look at the extra material in the body used to conduct, to conduct the electricity. Again, it's not as simple as finding the first convenient hole and using whatever bolt will fit to screw it down. So we need to do it properly. Just like the negative side, the positive side needs to be simple but solid. The battery cable should go from the battery to the starter motor using the same copper zero gauge wiring and from the starter to the power distribution stud and alternator charge terminal. You don't need zero gauge for this bit, four, six or eight gauge will, will work depending on the electrical demands in the car. And remember that this wire will be live with 12 or 16 volts. Route and protect the wire so it won't be rubbed or chafed through. You may want to fit a circuit breaker to the battery cable positive close to the battery. So if the worst does happen, the battery cable will be cut off from the battery. You'll need a breaker capable of supplying enough current for the starter motor, which could be a few hundred amps. Uh, and while you're at it, um, this would probably be a good place to fit a battery isolator or a kill switch. This is typically a four pole switch, which has two big terminals and two little terminals. The two big terminals go in line with the battery positive cable. 
while the two little terminals are used to disable the alternator charge or kill the engine management system. This way, when the isolator switch is turned off, the engine will turn off too. It won't be able to run on solely on the alternator's output voltage. Testing the correct functionality of this switch is commonplace at most motorsport scrutineering, so make sure to do it right. Well, that's it for Tech Tuesday. Thanks for sticking with me. See you next week.